Wow, good morning. This is really, this is really exciting, um, just to see everybody in the room. You, you come here for inspiration. I look at you for inspiration, the energy, all the potential you have. Thank you for being here, and thank you for inviting me. We are an Emory family. A big part of what I am right now and what I do is actually I owe to the education I got at Emory and all the support I got here. My daughter graduated from Emory two years ago. My son will graduate this year. So you guys are getting great education. Unbiased opinion. <laughs> <laughs> so when, uh, when they asked me to, um, to speak, uh, I was wondering, like, what, what can I say that will be useful for you? And I've uh, been getting a lot of questions lately from, um, from many of you who are friends of my kids, from uh, kids of my uh, friends and family and various uh, students that I also mentor uh, here at Emory and other places about global health. It seems like global health is a new buzzword. There's a lot of interest in global health. M most of the schools are starting new global health schools, even for undergrad. So people want to know, like, how do I even get into global health? And if I get into global health, what does it take to actually make a difference? Can I make an impact? Or I'm going to be another one of these millions of people who are working in this field. So what I will do today, and to follow up uh, on the uh, first speaker, on Daniel's uh, talk, I thought I'll tell you my story. I'll tell you about all the lessons I learned uh, in my path to, um, to get to do global health and what I think you know, can help make a difference and can help you and give you the tools to, uh, to also uh, be able to make the most impact you can make. And you don't have to look too far, actually. The main message I have, for you to make a difference, you first have to believe that you can actually do it. It's about believing that you can make a difference. And you look here at Emory, you have a lot of sources of inspiration, just starting with some of the uh, visiting professors. You have some very uh, famous uh, folks here, the uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, and uh, I don't know how many of you have read the book that has quotes about how much he um, emphasizes belief in yourself. And same thing for His Holiness, the Dalai uh, Lama, who uh, also um, had made it a clear point that in order for you to make a difference and to change the world and make it a better world, you have to actually believe in yourself. So how, how did I get there? What is my story? I'll try to be brief because there's a lot of other things I would like to talk about. Hopefully the time will allow that. Uh, but I'm hoping, I'm, I'm just telling my story in the hope that you will find something relevant in it for you that can help you in your career path. Uh, but also, I was inspired by a lot of people, and I learned a lot just by listening and by reading and by talking to people that I think, really, this is the, the bottom of what I want to get to. I started and uh, uh, grew up in Lebanon, uh, North Lebanon, in a city called Tripoli that's actually mainly known for its big crusader castle and the sweets. It had delicious baklava and all kinds of sweets. Um, then decided to, do to, medical, to go to medical school. I wasn't really sure uh, what I wanted to do. You know, medical school, I had this uh, interest in biological sciences. I thought, this is it, you know, we're gonna change the world. And uh, it was great. It was, I went to medical school at the American University of Beirut in Lebanon on this beautiful Mediterranean uh, coast. And um, it was a life-changing experience for me. This was actually, I grew up in a Francophone system. And moving on to an English system was like it just opened up my eyes. And it was a completely different way of thinking. And it did give me the, um, uh, this is first where I started thinking, uh, maybe it's the influence of that uh, American self-confidence. It's like, I can actually, <laughs> I can make a difference in this world. I'm not just like one, one individual. Then came to the US to do my training here in um, um, internal medicine and infectious diseases. And one of the reasons I like infectious diseases is because it has, it looks at the whole global, um, global uh, situation. It's not just one, uh, one particular organ you're looking at and then learned about the epidemiology training at CDC. And I've been now at CDC since 1993. This is what changed really my life is making it to, um, to a public health um, career path. So we are epidemiologists, you know, we start by defining everything. We just have to define everything, otherwise we get lost. So global health, you know, people sometimes think different things about global health. It's, uh, you know, it's basically 
any, any public health activities where you address problems that go across borders. Um, and, but the best, the best definition I could find is, is the one uh, by Dr. De Kock, who was the uh, head of the Global uh, Health Center at CDC a few years ago, and I underlined some of the key concepts that you really have to remember. Global health has to be guided by strong science. This is critical. This is why the science and the you know, basics uh, that you are learning here, how to do good science, is critical. But also, its core values is the values of justice. It's all about social justice and about equity. This is what global health is about. However, we are not naive. We do recognize that politics and you know, policy issues in general have also a lot of influence on global health. So is it important to work in global health these days? You bet. It is, we're still facing huge issues. We're in 2015 now, we're in the new millennium, but there are millions of people who die needlessly every single day. And this is unacceptable. I mean, we, we still have maternal death. I'm not gonna go through the whole list. I mean, you know, people have different interests why they decide what areas they wanna focus on, but even now, we have about over 250,000 women who die in childbirth every year in 2015. I mean, this is, this is the kind of stuff that shouldn't be happening right now in this world. But, you know, the, the one area where, where I've spent the last 20 years working is how to better combat and how to prevent and control infectious diseases. And this is something that is not just a cause of scare. You know, it makes the movie, the, the work we've been doing with Ebola now makes contagion looks, you know, like a piece of cake. Um, so, you know, we, we have, we are facing serious infectious diseases threats that need to be addressed and they need solutions now and yesterday. Um, the, I've done a lot of work on vaccine preventable diseases. Uh, this is, as many of you know, vaccines are the most effective public health intervention ever. They have saved more lives than any other intervention other than clean water believe it or not. I mean, most of the diseases in this country doesn't disappear because of any specific intervention. They disappeared once we introduced clean water. But my story with the global vaccine started about uh, 10 years ago in, 20, uh, in 2005 when Gavi, which is a, a private par uh, public partnership based in Geneva, decided to do something about a disease called Hib or Haemophilus influenza type B, it's a bacterium that causes severe meningitis in children and severe pneumonia. Before we had vaccines, globally, we estimated about 400,000 kids died every single year because of Hib. In this country, we've had a vaccine since 1990. But in the rest of the world, many of the countries, they still do not have access to that vaccine. And even Gavi, they came in 2000 and they offered them the vaccine free, but they still didn't take it. There's a long story for that. However, we have a vaccine that is excellent. We have a vaccine that's actually very effective, very safe, one of the best vaccines we've had, but still these uh, countries do not have access to the vaccine. Why is that? I mean, countries didn't know about the, the, the disease because the disease is not easily diagnosed. It's a bacteria that needs specialized laboratory. I mean, kids will develop meningitis or pneumonia they die, nobody knows exactly why they have it. Um, and also the vaccines were expensive, a lot more expensive than the basic vaccines that countries had in their national immunization program, which were mainly the tetanus, uh, diphtheria, and polio, the basic uh, immunizations. So, you know, when, when we started, uh, and actually this, just to step back a little bit, this is something that if you haven't heard about, you all need to know, anyone who wants to work on global health needs to be aware of the Millennium Developmental Goals. The MDGs, as they are called, these are a set, set of goals that were set in 2000 when all the countries in the world actually came together and said, we cannot continue to face these horrible global problems. There needs to be something about it. We need to do more about health, about uh, education, about environmental sustainability. And they came up with eight goals. Three out of the eight goals are actually health related. Number four, which is for child health, number five for maternal health, and number six for HIV AIDS. Unfortunately, the goals were to actually, for number four, for example, to reduce child mortality in the world by two-thirds between 2000 and 2015. 
We are in 2015 now, and there are many countries in the world that have not been able to do that, but many countries have, and one of the reasons they have is because they introduced these life-saving vaccines, like hip vaccine, like other vaccines that prevent pneumonia and diarrhea that remain the major causes of death. So the work we're doing was actually very well linked to the MDGs, and this is, this is where policy becomes involved into global health, because for countries, they wanted to meet that goal, otherwise there was this huge pressure on them to do it. This is where we were in 2005 when we started. Uh, there were about 72 Gavi eligible countries. To be eligible for Gavi funding, you have to have, you have to be very poor. You have to have an income, your individual income should be less than $1,000 a year. So this was the poorest countries in the world, mainly in Africa and South Asia, but only 25% of them had introduced. And our task was to go to all these countries and actually work with them to figure out why they cannot do it and what does it take to introduce the vaccines. So, so we're faced with a problem. In 2005, this was the norm for how countries make decisions about certain interventions. You have to go, you have to get uh, your data on disease burden, you have to know about the vaccine, cost effectiveness, et cetera, et cetera. And we looked at this, we had at least 50 countries we needed to work in. We said, we will never reach our goal if we have to go step by step. So, so we said, we're not gonna go like this. We have to go all of these at the same time, and countries could do it, you know, they don't have to be babysat. So, you know, this wasn't, again, you know, being inspired by others. We, it wasn't groundbreaking approach. It was just the same what uh, Albert Einstein said. If you have a problem that you're facing, you have to actually do something differently about it if you want to solve it. Another success story, you know, that is very important in the global health world and the global vaccination world is the story of smallpox eradication. Smallpox is a horrible disease that used to kill millions of people and also scar them. If they didn't die, they would be scarred. They, you know, it's, it's a really horrible disease that nobody wants to have. The world decided um, back in the uh, mid-60s uh, that this disease has to be eradicated. And to date, this is the only infectious disease, actually the only disease that we have ever eradicated. So it's a, it's a great success story. We continue to learn from these lessons. And Dr. Fagi, who, um, who was at the time a physician working in Nigeria and India when he worked on smallpox, wrote this book that I recommend highly for people who are interested in global health about house on fire and his story in the field. And he also didn't want to follow the status quo. He said, you know, basically first he said, you have to believe in something before you can see it. So again, going back to the theme, there were a lot of naysayers when he started working. The norm was that you have to do mass vaccinations. You have to go and give vaccines to everybody. And he said, no, I'm not going to do that. I don't have enough vaccines. I'm going to go just to the villages where there are outbreaks, and I'm going to vaccinate just these villages, which is, this is where the analogy of house on fire. If you have a fire, you just go and pour water on the house where there's fire. You don't just go pour it all over the place. But again, we needed to have a plan. You always need to have a plan. You need to have all the activities you need to do, etc. You're going to hear a lot of big words, strategic approach, strategic plan. We had one, of course, for our HIB initiative work. We relied heavily on doing the right research, communications, uh, coordinate all kinds of activities. But, you know, the, the really the bottom line here is you need to have your checklist. Another book that I thought was quite inspiring that is very simple concept is the idea of a checklist. Like when you guys, I, I know I hear from my kids all the time, every time you're planning a party, you have your little checklist, right? You have to send the, you have to send the invite or post it on you know, whatever social media you're using, you have to get the food, you, the music, etc. Very, very basic concept. In this world now where we are having all this information that we are dealing with, if we don't have our checklist, something we're gonna miss, we're gonna do something wrong. So, but then for you guys, what do you need? What do you need to, make a, to, to be successful in global health? You need, you, you need to have your own checklist too. You need, of course, the education that you're getting here, but you need a lot of experience, you need communication skills, a lot of understanding of social context of, in the global settings. You need to be very flexible and quite persistent. Going back to the science. Don't ever forget about the science. Otherwise, your interventions will be baseless. You know, it won't go too far. We always need data. This is, you know, anytime you have a problem, try to find the data for the hip vaccines. We went to these countries, said, what's your problem? It's like, oh, we don't know how much disease we have. 
It's like, okay, we started looking. Many of them had data, but the decision makers are not people who have time going to look into what's published, what's available from uh, PhD student thesis, etc. We gathered a lot of data in some countries. We had to actually fund some uh, research studies in order to generate data that they can use to convince, you know, because they have to go, the Minister of Health has to go to Minister of Finance, say, I need so much funding to introduce a vaccine, and without the data, this is not gonna happen. So we, we did all of this, and um, we used whatever social media, we had a website, you know, tried to make it in a language that they could understand. But the key, really, the, the pillar of our strategy was having good communications. We listened and we went to places and we talked to people and learned and listened again and again and again. I have never regretted going to a place even for a day, uh, even if I have to travel across the world for a day because I learned so much from being in the field and this is where the experience comes. These are some recent activities, uh, you know, for the HIB events, you know, we had to gather this bottom uh, picture here at the bottom right, we had to gather hundreds sometimes of stakeholders, people all who are engaged in vaccine work, whether it's finance, health, NGOs, pediatricians, everybody and get them to talk to each other and communicate. When there was an outbreak of cholera in Haiti, you know, we had to go to the hospital and understand why, why isn't this outbreak controlled so quickly? You know, we had to learn that they're having problems with training, they needed more disinfectants, they had basic infrastructure problems that you wouldn't even think about here. I was in Saudi Arabia last year for the corona outbreak and it was intriguing where this virus is coming from. We had to go to the neighborhoods, do case control studies, risk factor to understand where they're getting it, same in uh, Mali, when uh, the Ebola, we were preparing it for Ebola when they had the first case uh, last fall, and uh, you know the first case had come from Guinea. We couldn't understand, you know, thought Guinea is a different country. How how easily they? We went to the border there, that picture up in the left, and you know there's really no border. I mean, it just it took like one look at the borders to realize that people are coming in and out very freely. So, communications is critical, and I cannot underestimate or put more emphasis on the importance of face-to-face -face communication. We cannot sit here. I know you guys sit all the time and uh, you're texting each other. People often don't even call, you know, so you have to go there. You have to have eye contact. You have to sit with them and say, what is it that is actually, what's the problem? This might look to you like the uh, page probably from Delta magazine. This is part of my travel. Yeah, I would go across the world sometimes for one or two days to meet you know, some of the key folks and understand what's going on. Another big um, issue also I uh, learned uh, or important lesson for communication is you need to understand the concept. We used to use this iceberg analogy to uh, illustrate to countries why it's so difficult to measure disease uh, burden for HIB and that whatever we are seeing is actually the tip of the iceberg. We were in Burkina Faso at one point presenting to all the Francophone Afro countries and I have one of the participants who got up and said, you know doctor, I have never seen an iceberg. I live in West Africa. This is, this is what we would understand here as this only represents a very small, and, and he gave me the slide. And I learned a big lesson from him. Continue, we need to ask questions and make mistakes. Never assume that people know everything. Wrapping up. But at the same time, you have to keep your focus. You're gonna go to a country, you're gonna find out that you're lining up with a zillion other groups who are waiting to talk to the minister. Everybody thinks their project is the most important. And you know, you're gonna look around and say, what am I here to do? There's so much, so many other problems. Keep your focus. We knew there are things, a lot of things to fix, but we were gonna fix one problem at a time and we kept our focus on the children. And remember, this is not your project. Countries own these projects. You're doing it for the sake of the country. You need to be true partners. And I'll be wrapping up. Mentors, we've talked about a lot of mentors. These were the key, um, my key senior uh, executive committee members. But again, remember, you're the one in the field making the decisions. The, you can call on a mentor every now and then, but applying same standards to yourself and others is very, very critical. This is my daughter. When she was 15 is when we started this project. She was among the first kids in the US to get this vaccine but many kids in the uh, rest of the world didn't even make it to 15 because they didn't have the chance to that. And I always remember this. Again, 
global health is not for the weak of heart. You're going to be completely out of your comfort zone often. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to feel that you have no idea what you're doing. If you don't have the passion and if you don't really want to do this, you're not going to be able to make an impact. But it does pay off. Again, as Einstein said, it's not that I'm so smart. It's just that I stay with problems longer. Of course, nobody does this by themselves. It's always you need to have your team. You need to make sure you have the right partners. But it does pay off. Last year, our team got the Federal Employee of the Year Award. We don't always do that, and we don't work for this. But the work does get recognized one way or another. And I'd like to um, wrap, with, uh, wrap up with uh, where we are right now. This is the whole world actually has introduced hip vaccine. All of the Gavi countries, even the ones that didn't exist before, because meanwhile we generated a new one, South Sudan. So instead of 72, now we have 73 Gavi countries that have introduced this vaccine. And um, even China has most of the vaccine in the private market. But um, again, as Mandela said, it always seems impossible until it's done. And that's exactly how we felt when we started with our HIB uh, project. The key thing is continue to believe in yourself and never, 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 never give up. Thank you.